Okay, good afternoon, dear colleagues. It is a pleasure uh, to be on the podium to share some of my clinical experience uh, with this technology. I can tell you that uh, we have been in involved with uh, this uh, technology now for roughly nine years and uh, have been very critical in the beginning because the technology was not as mature as it is now. And we have grown into that technology with our patient treatment more and more. Uh, if you would like to have uh, the handout of this lecture, then uh, you can send me an email and then uh, we have a download server at the University of Bern where we can give you then the PDF. I have a short introduction and then we're going to talk primarily about loading, early loading protocols in standard sites, that means sites without bone grafting in the posterior mandible and maxilla, and about early loading protocols in implant sites with sinus floor elevation. These are the two main areas where we use this technology to make decisions uh, for the time of loading. The introduction gives you, uh, let's say, my basic beliefs how we should treat patients. You see that the primary objectives are always successful outcomes with high predictability, low risk for complications. On the other hand, we have tried to improve our surgical and clinical procedures to make implant therapy more attractive to our patients and therefore we try to reduce number of surgeries, reduce healing periods and treatment time and of course also reduce uh, the morbidity. And the reduction of healing period and treatment time, that is actually what I'm going to talk to you. We have seen a tremendous progress in that field because we all know that the current, uh, the, the original healing periods, three to six months, have been employed in the 1980s. What kind of benchmarks we are achieving, you see? We try to have a very low failure rate, and this is now documented for at least 10 years with all our patients. We treat roughly 550 to 600 patients uh, in our group, and the failure rate during healing is between 0.5 and 0.7%. And we are in the process to complete a 10-year study on a large patient pool. And I can tell you that uh, the success rates in low-risk patients at 10 years is above 98%. So we have a very low rate of late failures. Uh, in smokers, it's slightly increased. And we see a very low incidence in 10 years for peri-implantitis, for example, which is, seems to be the big topic in particular in Sweden. Now, these excellent success rates, of course, are important for the department because we treat most of the patients referred by dentists. And I look at them like our, our customers, so we try to keep them happy with successful outcomes. Now, when we look at the factors that influence the treatment outcomes, you see that this circle, the clinician, is slightly larger than the three other ones. The patient with all the risk factors he has, the treatment approach, and of course the utilized biomaterials. So when we look at the treatment approach, then of course loading protocols come into place. And we all know that uh, we can have uh, conventional loading, we can have early loading, or we can even have immediate loading. And we will have electron immediate loading as well. I will focus on early loading. Now, the loading protocols, as I said, in the 1980s, the conventional loading des described by Bronnemark, you see, three to six months, Schroeder, three to four months, that was what we have used, how we were taught by our teachers at that time. And we have seen a trend to reduce that uh, in the last 25 to 30 years. Uh, the loading protocols in the late 90s have already shifted shorter, so the concept of early loading was introduced, six to eight weeks, and then full occlusion loading, and still conventional loading here, and of course immediate loading became much more attractive because we have had in the beginning, of course, primarily in full edentials cases. Then the early 2000s, so today you could say, it has changed again, and this is based on an ITI consensus conference 2008 that actually immediate loading today is defined everything within a week, whereas early loading is between two and eight weeks, so we are different time points, and this is all early loading from our point of view, whereas now, interestingly, conventional loading is defined everything two months and longer. As you can see, the whole thing has been shortened to the left, 
and shifted to the left. Now this primarily is due to the progress we have seen with implant surfaces and for sure also increased knowledge how to treat patients. Now for a specific implant surface, and I have been involved in all the research for many, many years, it's documented that we have seen an evolution in surface technology. We know that today we have various top modern implant surfaces which can offer these kind of earlier reduced healing periods and it was an improvement of topography, and today it's also an improvement of chemistry. So this actually really made that happen, that we can load much earlier today. And again, we don't want to compromise the primary objectives that we have reduced uh, uh, predictability for our patients. We need to have high predictability, low risk for complications. With that, I would like to move now into the early loading in standard sites. And I would like to go back again to a development that was made in the mid-90s. You see, remember, we have used that implant surface uh, with a macroporosity, microporous, as a porous surface uh, that was an, a blasted, was an, uh, an coated one, a TPS, introduced first in 74 and then we moved to a sandblasted acid edge. There are various surfaces uh, using that technology today. When we do this kind of progress, we always do first the homework with preclinical studies, and here you see some of the papers our group has published in 91, a very, uh, today, very well-cited paper, and many others. And when we have had, in particular, the results of the removal torque studies in mini-pigs, we figured out that these new surfaces offer much better bone anchorage at early time points when compared to the standard implant surfaces used at that time. So we made a very courageous decision that we go and run a study with an early loading protocol already at six weeks. That means these implants were placed standard sites and put in full occlusion at six weeks with provisional restorations and then we documented how they perform. Here you see a case at six weeks where the abutment was inserted with a torque of 35 and then put into full function. Here you see the same patient five years. Now the six to eight week early loading period is today very well documented. I would say primarily for two implant surfaces when you go out up to five years follow up, osteotite and SLA. And you can see that the success and survival rates are very high in the high 90%, so actually very satisfactory. Then early 2000, actually, Professor Steinemann, who was the driving force behind this, said we have to change the chemistry. And then a uh, chemically modified SLA surface offered hydrophilicity. And again, this was documented first in preclinical studies. See, uh, first one published in Journal of Dental Research 2004, and uh, uh, today, of course, we have many more publications to document that this is a very interesting surface. So that gave us the idea, six to eight weeks is fine, but is there a chance that we could do early loading at a much shorter healing period? Let's say cut it again, 50%, three to four weeks. So we made a decision, we go into a clinical study, a case series study, and put these implants into function at three weeks. That means at day 21. Of course, we were a little nervous about this if this is going to function. And therefore, we started to talk intensively how we could measure implant stability to make that decision. Because, of course, in the long run, it's always can we use it later in daily practice. And when you look at the techniques to measure implant stability at that time, I was thinking about perio test values, but we have used them many years uh, in follow-up studies, but you can only really measure that when you have a restored implant. Then insertion torque values, and are very popular in Sweden, would tell you I've never measured an insertion torque in all my years. I'm now involved 27 years with implant dentistry. And I would say there's a big disadvantage because you can only measure once but you cannot measure at three or six weeks, whatever, because there's only one measurement and then you rely on the measurement at implant surgery. And the third one, RFA. We know that this was introduced in 96 by Meredith, and we have seen that this technology had improved over the years, and we are in the third generation 
of that, this kind of device. So we made a decision to go for RFA to measure ISQ values for this study. You know, the first generation uh, was not really a good device from my point of view, not very clinical friendly. Uh, in particular, this cable was very disturbing, you see, and depending how you attached it, you got very inconsistent measurements. It could be a 75 and a 62 and a 69, and then, of course, you start to lose confidence in this technology. So the handling was not really good and the technique was not mature uh, when we started to use that. Here you see this transducer to be attached and of course you see this cable that was not really uh, very uh, convincing. Then 2004, then the next generation came and that already was a big step forward from my point of view. They introduced a transducer that was replaced by a magnetic post, so it was much easier. See, and we have figured out that actually the measurements were much more consistent. Still, we had some problems with, uh, with lights when there was electromagnetic noise in the room. Sometimes the reading was not possible, so that was not still the end of the development. But we started to use that for that study that I was just talking about. So here you see an implant is placed, this is magnetic post is inserted, and then you to measure. Sometimes you get two measurements because depending if you measure from the buckle or from the mesial, then you might have two different stability of the ISQ values. The big breakthrough from my point of view was actually then last year. I saw it the first time at the AO conference in uh, San Diego. Uh, when we got this device. You see, first of all, it looks like a nice uh, gimmick, you see, like an iPod, slightly larger. So this actually improves, impresses all the patients when you introduce that. Same smart pack is used, and we have seen that the measurements are very quick and they're very consistent now. So you go there and within three seconds you have a measurement and you measure three times, most often you have three times the same value. And that is really now very convincing. So you see how this is attached, that's not too difficult, and then normally we measure from two sides. See, we measure from the mesial and from the buckle, and uh, sometimes this is the same, sometimes you get two different values, and then it's recorded, and then the smart pack, which cannot really be re-sterilized uh, uh, because then uh, you have some corrosion that goes into the chart so we can use the same smart pack for the same patient longitudinally, that's possible. It's very well documented here, only a few papers where we have been somehow involved, of course not in the beginning. You see we have been involved three times so far with measurements on this study and uh, I think today there are more than 100 uh, original papers or case reports on the technology. So 2005, we started that three-week loading study in healed sites in the posterior mandible mainly, mainly first molar replacements, and as I said, non-grafted sites. That means implants could be placed without bone grafting, so implants were inserted, then the measurements were taken, and to allow a full function load at 21 days, we took intrasurgical impressions to prepare then the provisionals, and then at 21 days we measured, and a certain uh, ISQ value was present, we initiated full functional load. Here you see in this patient, it was an 81, a very high value, and you see now uh, uh, then the healing cap, same patient three weeks later, when you have such a high value, then you want to see slightly better value, but not a clear decrease, otherwise that would make me nervous. You see three weeks later, the measurement 83, so this prepared provisional crown got in place, and you see adjusted the occlusion, and then this implant was in full function. The implants were at least 10 millimeters long, also not extra short implants, so 10 or 12 millimeters. So here you see the patient at six months, so we measured at various time points prospectively to see how the values will develop. You see it went up to 89, this patient. That I think was the highest we have seen in that study. Radiograph was taken and then the patients were sent back to the referring dentist and they did then the definitive restorations, most often with cemented 
crowns. Here you see the two-year follow-up of the same patient. Now, of course, we can't take a measurement anymore because we have cementation. A case a little bit later, how it would be treated today, I would say, you see, again, a nicely healed ridge, small flaps, implants are inserted. Then you see the measurement 8, another high value. It's a 10 millimeter implant. And here you see the healing at three weeks. And then you see 83, slight increase. So that's the post. Patient went into final restoration, and this is then the three year follow up of the same patient. So it indicates very stable situation. It's important for me that actually I know what is the stability of that implant because tapping on it, that's not really reliable. And of course, since we go then straight today in daily practice into final restoration, so we can save the money for provisionals, and patients have a very cost effective and of course very attractive treatment modality. We published in 2009 in in Lars's journal, you see a paper by, with Michael Bornstein as first author. You see you had 56 implants with this uh, modified SLA surface. Uh, with that protocol, in two implants, we could not load at 21 days because actually in one, we could not remove the healing cap. Patients started to feel some pain, and the other one had a low ISQ value. So we just gave both implants more time to heal, and that's actually what we do today. When we measure at three or four weeks and we have a low ISQ value, then we just tell the patient, look, it's not mature enough, let's wait another four weeks. And then we measure again. And patient's management is very easy with this technology. The study has shown here, you see the box plots and here just the mean values. The mean value was above 70 for this type of implant. And you see that we have not seen a dip, which was typical for the previous implants we used. So at three weeks, already about three higher, and then it went up above 80 at six months. Now, based on that study, in the study, actually, we used 65 as a threshold. So we made a decision, uh, since we have often higher value than 70, that in the future, for daily practice, we are using 70 as a threshold for routine patients, because then you have a certain safety zone installed, so if an implant has an ISQ value of 70 plus at three or four weeks of healing, we give a green light patient go into final restoration. And I can tell you, in all the last three years, I have not seen one failure with this approach in our routine. And we do about one to 200 cases as implants like this per year. So here you see a maxillary case. Now here the ISQ was 70. Same approach, at three weeks we had at 72, so we took an impression, then final restoration a week later installed, it was already 77, one week later, and the patient received the crown, definitive restoration, two years later. So that is in 2008, and you see how the case has developed. Some remodeling here, here's some cement that had to be removed, and here you see then the steady state situation. The study is published yet uh, up to three years already, actually. Jay Perio, we had a paper by Bornstein, 2010, documenting that all 54 implants have a successful three-year follow-up. Actually, in these, of course, well-maintained group of patients, perfect, ideal situations, we had a 100% success and survival rate. So the loading protocols today we use for the standard sites in posterior areas is that we use early loading, and actually we use, in most of the cases, a three to four weeks healing period for these standard posterior sites. Uh, I think today now we are using most often four weeks or eight weeks because patients understand very easy this information because you tell them it's one month or two months. And for these standard sites, it's in most cases one month. What about sinus floor elevation? Of course, this is also a, a treatment we do quite often. We have more than 100 implants per year with the sinus crafting simultaneously. We use uh, both techniques, but more often the lateral window technique, and not as frequent the osteotome technique. That's about 90%, that's about 10%. For the lateral window technique, it's about 
60% simultaneous and 40% staged approach because uh, sometimes, of course, the bone height is not sufficient. You see here the decision tree when to use what? Uh, the bone height at the implant side is the decisive factor. If we have five millimeters and above, then we go for simultaneous techniques, of course, to limit the surgical technique to one surgery. And we are using actually these healing periods for a couple of years now. So osteotome technique, because there we normally have more bone, is two months and then we measure window simultaneous depends two to four months. And of course, here would be great if you could also use two months in most of the cases, but again, you need an objective measurement to make a decision when to load. Because if you lose that implant uh, six months later with a final restoration, this is a costly problem because then you treat the patient again free of charge. So the question here is, what are the factors influencing primary stability. And we know this is such a case as the implant place with a simultaneous sinus floor elevation. So it's for sure the remaining bone height at the implant site. It's the bone density at the, re at the local site. It's the surgical technique. Is it pre-tapped or non-pre-tapped? Of course, uh, if you are able to prepare a precise implant bed or not. And it's for sure also the shape and the dimensions of the inserted implant. Screw type implants, of course, are preferred and the dimensions certainly play a role as well. Let me show you two cases. I think I, I did these cases same day uh, a couple of months ago. You see that was on the left maxilla. The bone height here was about seven, eight millimeters. And you see the situation clinically. Uh, since we had a limited space here, uh, we had to use a bone level implant, which has a smaller diameter, as you can see. And since we had about six, seven millimeters of remaining bow tight, and we could place then a 12 millimeter implant, you see that the ISQ level was pretty good, 75. So that's for sure a case where you can expect that at eight weeks, it should be sufficiently mature. Okay, so at eight weeks, the patient has been recalled. So that was the initial measurement, 75. So we measure again at eight weeks, 80. That's very positive, so green light, final restoration. Same day on the other side, another patient, actually this is an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, he has been treated by a colleague, a little interesting finding here, and of course not too much of bone height in that area. You see a borderline case, 4.2 millimeters, but he's very busy, you see he's doing all these knee and hip surgeries. I normally see him at 7.30 in the morning before he goes to operatory. And then we said, yeah, let's try to do it simultaneously, but we'll see. So uh, we finally put the implant in simultaneously. You see the grafting. And then when I measured, then I, I was a little bit nervous because it was only 30. Now, how do we do our sinus grafting? In our sinus grafting, we always use autogenous bone to enhance new bone formation, but we mix it with the bone substitute, and that's the low substitution bone substitute to maintain the created height. So it's always a composite graft. And we have a surface which heals much faster than uh, surfaces we have used in the past. So at eight weeks, you see the patient again, so they did the reopening, and I was very curious to see how this low value had improved. And I tell you, frankly, I was very astonished to see that eight weeks, this patient had a 70. So I told him, I think we can have the guts to go into final restoration, and I sent the patient back to the referring dentist uh, to do that. So the improvement was very significant. Actually, it was nine weeks, I see here. He couldn't come at eight weeks. Now you see here uh, the radiograph, a lot of maturation, you see. Also we see a lot of new bone formation radio because we cannot see the border of the previous floor of the sinus. So that was, a, of course, an extreme case, but shows you the potential. So when we go for loading protocols in sinus floor elevation today, we use Ostel technique in all cases to measure baseline and to measure at eight weeks where we are, and then we make a decision if we can go into final restoration or not. Uh, 
I cannot give you the numbers how often that is possible. That will be actually analyzed next year because we want to do next year a prospective study including all sinus grafting cases, measure at eight weeks, see how often this is possible. I expect it's about 80%. And the others, we wait another four weeks to take a measurement again. Let me summarize, you see. I tried to show you that in the last couple of years we made some significant progress to make our treatment concepts more attractive, in particular in the areas where we have high functional load, as in the non-aesthetic areas. We are able to offer early loading protocols to most of our patients, not all of them. And the measurement of ISQ values has become a very important tool to objectively examine implant stability in daily routine. Really, uh, as critical as I was in the beginning, based on good, uh, of course, documentation and uh, increasing evidence from lots of studies, uh, I have now adapted and changed my mind. In standard implant sites, we try to do it at four weeks, most often, and in sinus grafting cases, we try to do it at eight weeks, and this will be analyzed in a clinical study next year by one of my third-year postdoc students to see how this is. And the threshold in our group, using our technique in terms of grafting, implant surface, whatever, we have set at 70, and with that, we have been quite successful. Thank you very much.